The U.S. state of Missouri has called the National Guard into the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson. It follows days of protests after an unarmed black teenager was shot dead by a white policeman. Apart from issues of race and civil rights, images of a police force more like an invading army have shocked America. This is Inside Story. Hello there, welcome to the programme, I'm Shuli Ghosh. It began with the shooting of an unarmed black teenager. Then came the protests and the tear gas. Now the National Guard has been called in to restore order in Ferguson, Missouri. A private autopsy report revealed that Michael Brown was shot at least six times and finally killed by a mortal wound to the head. Protesters see it as a case of racial profiling by a white police officer towards a black man. The sequence of events on August the 9th is now being investigated by St. Louis County and the FBI. Well, Rob Reynolds sent this update from Ferguson on what was the worst night of violence so far. There's still a whiff of tear gas here in the air in Ferguson, Missouri, and police helicopters circling overhead. Behind me, you can see the lights of uh, another detachment of police. Just a short while ago, uh, protesters were marching on this street towards a group of police in, in this direction behind me. Um, what happened then is not exactly clear. The uh, St. Louis City Police have uh, put out the word that a Molotov cocktail was thrown toward the police lines. That has not been confirmed by any eyewitnesses. The uh, police then told the crowd to disperse and began slowly moving them down this avenue here in Ferguson, the main street, uh, using uh, smoke bombs, uh, tear gas grenades, and uh, riding in armored vehicles, a lot of, a uh, large number of uh, very heavily armored and uh, armed uh, police officers. Well, Ferguson, like many of the suburbs around St. Louis, is a community in the midst of change. Around two thirds of its residents are black, but just three of the town's 53 police officers are black. The images coming out of the small American community are evocative of the civil rights era. Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 doesn't seem so different from Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. But for all the similarities, it is also very different and shockingly so. Today's police force is equipped with M16 rifles, grenade launchers and armoured personnel carriers. Well, since the 1990s, the federal government has increasingly militarised its police forces, a process that accelerated after the 9-11 attacks. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, government departments have distributed $4.3 billion worth of equipment to police. Watertown, Connecticut acquired a mine-resistance ambush-protected vehicle known as MRAP, designed to protect soldiers from roadside bombs. Police in Michigan and Indiana received Humvees, night vision rifle scopes and M16 automatic rifles. In Des Moines, the police department has two $180,000 bomb disarming robots. And in Bloomington in Georgia, police have four grenade launchers. So there's a lot to discuss here. Let's bring in today's guests. In Ferguson, Brittany Packnett. Executive Director of Teach for America St. Louis, she organised a rally in support of young people in Ferguson. Rosa Clemente in Massachusetts was the Green Party's vice presidential candidate in 2008 and is an academic specialising in the civil rights movement. And Hubert Williams in Washington, D.C., former president of the Police Foundation and former deputy special advisor to the police commission that investigated the police beating of Rodney King in Los Angeles. Uh, welcome to all my guests today. Brittany, let me start with you as you are in Ferguson. Uh, I, I mean, at times, uh, your town has looked like something out of eastern Ukraine or Iraq. Police wearing gas masks and body armors, and this is a, a tiny suburb. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's a very scary turn of events out here. I have been out here most days since um, 
most days since uh, Tuesday night or Monday night rather um, and it's gotten scarier each night. We thought Thursday was going to be a bit of a respite. Um, we saw a change in command and we thought that the streets were going to be safe. It was almost a party like atmosphere that night and then once again on Friday uh, we returned to tear gas and rubber bullets. So unfortunately peaceful protesters are not being allowed to walk the streets of their community to stay out past midnight even though they live here and to assemble uh, in the name of their fallen brother Mike Brown. Yeah, your governor has now called in the National Guard. He says that uh, this is because there are gangs of outsiders, not from your community, who are committing criminal acts. I mean, is that the case or are these disillusioned young people inside Ferguson? We don't exactly know who they are. The rumors are running rampant. Um, we are sure that they are outsiders because people in this community are peaceful. Um, they are family people and they just want to be able to walk around their community, send their children to school and go about their, their daily lives. We've heard everything that it's anarchists um, to gang members. Um, and we're, so we're not exactly sure. We keep hearing rumors. I will say, however, that there is also the additional rumor that it's uh, not outsiders at all, but law enforcement trying to agitate things. I don't know how true any of these things are my main concern is keeping people and children especially safe mm. rosa uh you know why is it that local neighborhoods like ferguson tiny communities with what twenty thousand people in them are being turned into war zones by local police forces well i mean let's not forget that this um situation began with the execution of Michael Brown and with the release of the autopsy and that last bullet to his head that right there shows this was an execution I believe the only people responsible for the violence are the police and the entire political system not only in Ferguson or the county of St. Louis not only in the state of Missouri but throughout the United States let me be clear there are Ferguson's in every corner of the United States. This is not an isolated incident. Two years ago, the Malcolm X grassroots movement released a report where we showed 313 extrajudicial killings in the year of 2012 of African American men, women, and children that were killed by law enforcement, white vigilantes, or security guards. What's going on in Ferguson with the calling of the National Guard is a complete clampdown and militarization. As a historian of the civil rights movement, one thing that was often used to break apart the community response was the consistent mainstream media as well as what I call leaders that are out of touch with these young people in general, national leaders like an Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, completely out of touch with what these young people are not going through the last week, but are going through from the moment they are born. Hubert, let me bring in you here. There, there seems to be two yeah, issues here. On the one hand, there's the, the increasing militarization of police forces. On the other hand, there is this uh, disconnect that young black communities feel from uh, those in positions of power. They, they feel that, uh, that, that the civil rights movement has not made as much progress as it should. Uh, just when it comes to the militarization of the, of the police force, I mean, is that necessary? Is it necessary to hand over weapons from the US Army mm. to police forces today? Let me answer your question this way. Um, there's an old adage, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are destined to repeat it. Um, I think that your guess who suggested that we may see more of these problems in the future is looking at a historical projection of what we saw in the 60s with the civil rights, with civil disorder and riots. We also had, for the first time in the history of this country, a presidential commission on law enforcement to look at the civil, dis civil disturbances. Uh, what they found was that underlying grievances that had been in existence for a long time were pent up and s exploded because of an incident between the police and the public. This is what we've got there. The issue of uh, the militarization is highly problematic, and I'll tell you why. It's nothing wrong with the police having this kind of equipment, 
The issue is, what is it to be used for? If a city was subject to a terrorist attack or something like that, that nature, then the police would have some justification in using that kind of equipment. When you're dealing with protesters exercising constitutional rights, walking the streets, that's a different matter. Secondly, let me say also that the justification for the use of deadly force is defense of life, either the life of the officer or the life of, a, of someone else. It's very difficult to conceive of um, the use of that kind of force by the police without some human life being subject to it. Well, this is it. the problem, isn't it? So, because, I mean, this, uh, the, the whole idea of making police more powerful and giving them more equipment was born out of a fear of uh, Islamist terrorists or specific situations like hostage taking or hijacking. But more and more, it, this equipment is being used and these strategies are being used to deal with uh, common everyday um, criminal activity. <clears throat> Let me say this to you also. I, I think I ought to just put uh, things in a, in a bit of context. Uh, my background is in law enforcement also, and I'm, I'm also an attorney. Um, I commanded the police force in Newark, New Jersey. I was also the president of the National Law Enforcement of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Um, there's been a movement in the police world since the 60s to change the way they interact with the public. A if you ask any police chief in a major city in America today, they will tell you that uh, community-oriented poli policing is their style of policing. Once well, you well, it's introduce not in Ferguson, into, is it? Well, I can tell you this. Ferguson is, uh, some of the things that's happened there is, 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 is questionable. I mean, I don't understand them. Uh, for example, uh, why the name of the officer was not released. Uh, there's been something I've heard in media that, well, they were concerned that the officer might be in jeopardy because of that, but then they do release the name of the officer. Is they no longer concerned about the jeopardy? Well, let me ask, let me ask uh, Brittany, because she, she's in Ferguson. Th this is something th um, that has been deeply criticized, the fact that there was this delay, and then suddenly not only was the name of the police officer released, but also pictures of Michael Brown, the boy who was shot, um, apparently taking part in a store robbery. Is this some kind of clumsy attempt to justify what happened, do you think, Brittany? That's certainly what we believe is happening in this community, and we've seen it happen time and time again where the victim is the one who's put on trial and the victim's character is assassinated in the same way that Michael Brown was slain in the street. The unfortunate thing is that the truth took so long to come out that we've now got multiple truths that people are claiming are truths. Um, and so it's very difficult to see our way through what's happening. The fact of the matter is people in this community simply do not trust law enforcement. I'm 29 years old. I've lived here 26 of my 29 years in North County. And as an African-American woman with a younger brother, I've been taught, um, as has he, to be very weary of the police. I asked a third grader the other day, I said, what do you think of when you see a police officer? And he said, run. He lives in this community. He didn't say that's somebody that's there to protect me. He didn't say that that's somebody that's there to support me. He said that's somebody who I should be afraid of. That's somebody what who could kill Rosa's me. What about Rosa's point? So Rosa was making the, the point. Day, this this that theory uh, about community policing is not happening in Ferguson. Yeah, and Rosa was making the point that uh, young people don't identify with black political leaders anymore. Uh, leaders like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, both of whom have been to your community. Why don't they identify with them? Well, I will say that I was out here uh, in Ferguson for about the fifth or sixth day when, when Reverend Jackson showed up, and people were glad to see someone who could continue to bring national media attention and international media attention because the people of Ferguson do not want to be forgotten. We do not want people to turn away from what's happening here. I will say, however, that is exactly why we organized a rally for young people and have been working on our uh, Don't Shoot social media campaign to truly elevate their voices. The people that are suffering most under police brutality and under this police state 
need that is currently existing in Ferguson are young African-American people. We are not listening to them enough, and when they are not heard and when they are chastised for the way that they choose to express their, their frustration, um, they, they, get, they get very annoyed, right? They, want it, they disconnect um, from, from some of our classic leaders and some of our, um, some of our older generation. And so if we continue to chastise our young people instead of elevate their voice and understand where they're coming from, we're going to continue to see the same problem. Rosa, I could see you uh, nodding with that. Um, aside from younger black people perhaps not identifying with the, the older uh, prominent members of the, the black civil rights movement, is there also a divide in the black community based on, on generation or class or living in areas like Ferguson where the population has become more black but the power structure and the officials and the local government and the police are all still predominantly white? Well, I think that's an excellent point, and I think Ferguson actually is also highlighting the massive gentrification that has been going on in urban communities where now many working class African American and Latinos are being pushed to what used to be predominantly white suburbs that are not predominantly African American and Latino with predominant white leadership. I mean, except for the fact that these young people after 18 can exercise their right to vote, I really look at Ferguson as an example of an apartheid city, right? where you have a majority people people of color and under a mi uh, minority white rule essentially and I think particularly for African American and Latino young people again from the moment they are born they are known as targets and this idea of community policing just does not exist and the idea particularly that more black or Latino cops will actually act differently is something that has been studied and as someone who comes from New York City I know many black black and Latino cops that have murdered and executed young black and Latino men in the streets as well. Okay, let me, let me um, give you President Obama's uh, reaction to this. Um, he's actually taking a very measured approach to the situation in Ferguson. On Thursday, he said, when something like this happens, the local authorities, including the police, have a responsibility to be open and transparent about how they are investigating that death and how they are protecting the people in their communities. Now, to me, um, President Obama has perhaps not been as strong about the racial divides as he could have been. Hubert, do you think President Obama is doing enough to tackle these kind of issues head on? Question, he's the president of the United States and he's not the mayor of that city. Um, he does not have uh, jurisdiction or authority to do some of but the things. But surely he has a might. view. He's a black man in the most, uh, um, the highest <laughs> position in the land, in the, in the, in the world. He also, has an, he also has an attorney general that's speaking out on these issues that's initiated an investigation to deal with these issues. I think the question is broader and I think that to focus on it purely on the basis of race without looking at the, uh, the I would look at the younger people in this country uh, as different from what I saw like in my generation coming up. And that goes for uh, Hispanics, whites, as well as blacks. African Americans have always suffered this kind of discrimination. and It's been problematic. But we have not seen or heard uh, the white community speak out with the strength that they did during the civil rights movement when they participated in these marches. And nor have we seen the leadership in policing uh, that do believe strongly in community policing. The progressive leaders speak out on these issues, particularly with respect to how the police should operate, what the policies are, when they should use force, when they should not use force. Now, I happen to know that these organizations have got policies that say you use deadly force only in defense of life. I also know that there are Supreme Court decisions that support that point of view. But I have not heard... Uh, any leadership speaking out. So I could understand, for example, why some of the people here, particularly in Ferguson, feel that this idea of community policing is, is just a not working. It's not a good idea. It is a good idea. It may not be working in Ferguson. It is uh, working I mean, in I, other I, places. I, and I think it's really What is deeply depressing is that we keep doing stories like this. Uh, I mean, Am, uh, Amadou Diallo shot 19 times by police. He was unarmed. Sean Bell shot by... Uh, 
NYPD officers in 2006. He was unarmed. Trayvon Martin, 17-year-old, shot by a white neighbourhood watch volunteer. He was unarmed. And Michael Brown now shot several times, according to the autopsy, and he was unarmed. Rosa, why does this keep happening? In the last 20 days, we've seen the choking of Eric Gardner, the killing of John Crawford in a Walmart, and the murder last week of Ezio Ford, who had mental health issues, who his family called the police for help, and now the killing of Michael Brown. We need to be very clear. The police may have rules, they do not follow them. The police in America have and always will continue to act with impunity. And the fact that the Democratic governor of this state would call in the National Guard to quell, quote, a Molotov cocktail, and that this policeman has not even been arrested really shows the white supremacist disdain for black and brown life in this okay, country. Okay, Brittany, let me, uh, let me bring you in because I can see you, you, you want to say something very you, strongly. I would like to be able to, thank you. Thank you. I don't disagree with you, but I would like to be able to make sure that we have perspective from the ground because this community continues to suffer. And I, as I just said, people speaking for this community is part of the problem. So what is happening here is not that people do not believe that community policing can work. The problem is that people have never seen community policing in North County. It's never happened. Like I said, I've been here for over 20 years. That is not the kind of policing that we have had access to and that has been given to us. The, the 48 hours that it was given to us was given to us by Captain Johnson and he has been undermined the entire way. So he hasn't been allowed to be the kind of community police officer building relationships and understanding what's going on with young people in our families like he wants to. The other important thing to recognize is that Ferguson is actually not an urban area. It is an inner ring suburb and the people who live here are not here because of gentrification. People moved, African American families moved into Saint, North St. Louis County in the 1970s and 80s when they finally moved to middle class uh, status and were here to get better educations for their children and better property value. So the fact of the matter is that the, the, the thing that has been simmering in Ferguson and in North County for a long time and the reason why this powder keg finally blew is the fact that we've been here for decades. African American families have been here owning businesses, contributing tax dollars, leading this community. We are not seen in the power structure and we've consistently been told for those decades that we do not belong okay, by the way that the police treat us. Hubert, by the way that the I can see that you want, to, uh, you want to come in there. Well, number one, I, I think she's making a, a very valid point. And, and I think that the listeners ought to understand that this is uh, historical in America. Uh, the Presidential Commissioner on Law Enforcement uh, wrote a significant report on this. And um, they were concerned about the failure of the police to be accountable and about the style of policing that was exercised. For example, they said that uh, police departments tend to exercise their policies and their authority in the suburban communities, particularly Caucasian communities, is their duty was to protect and serve. But in the inner city, their duty is enforcement of the law. We recognize, I think law enforcement recognizes that there needs to be a change. Uh, some police leaders are not changing and they are practicing the same tactics that have been used for decades. And the end result is what we've seen in Ferguson right now and this is likely okay. to persist this undercurrent for, for a long time Guys, we are we are gonna we're, we're getting to the end of the show and we are running out of time i just want to uh, a, a couple of very short questions rosa very quickly do you believe that the authorities in ferguson really understand how their actions are reverberating throughout america not at all. And I think, um, as Brittany said, she's on the ground. But let me just be clear that my, this case has become bigger than Michael Brown and Ferguson. And as someone that's married to a black man that has been stopped and frisked, I fear every day. Every day, this is my overwhelming fear as someone married to him. So I completely understand what Brittany is doing. And I think the work that she is doing in specific, working with young people so at least they can express how they feel is critically important in this okay. time. And of course not. These people in leadership have no idea of how these young people are feeling every day of their lives. Um, very last point to uh, Brittany. Uh, I mean, uh, is this going to get sorted out, Brittany? Where do you see this ending? 
I certainly hope it gets sorted out. I want to be fundamentally clear. We cannot get to long-term solutions about police brutality against African-American young people until we get the tear gas out of people's eyes. So we need peace on the streets in Ferguson before we can get to the real solutions. And we need to hear from our young people so that they can help us build those solutions because they need to be the ones leading us out of this. It's been a really, really fascinating discussion. Guys, thank you very much indeed for joining me on the program today. A big thank you to our guests, Brittany Packnett, Rosa Clemente and Hubert Williams. And you can add your voice to the discussion. You can leave your comments on facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story. We're also on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. I'm Shuri Ghosh. Thanks for watching from me and all the team here. Bye for now.